yay, this is working. We get the clicker. So yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you again for, for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, this, um, what I call a cloud native Swiss knife. My name is Ricardo. I'm a computing engineer at CERN. Uh, let's jump right through it. If this works, yeah, it does. All right, so I'm from Switzerland. Like CERN is based in Switzerland. So one common thing that we see everyone carries often is a Swiss knife. Uh, it's a handy tool. Um, it was actually created more than 100 years ago. And it was the description that I found was that uh, it was a tool that allowed people to, or soldiers in this case, open canned food and maintain the Swiss service rifle. So two very different things, but two things that a group of people had to do uh, often uh, when they were in service. So this became really popular. Uh, to the point that uh, the company that was building them started adding new tools. People had ideas, let's put more things in, and they started producing different variations of, of the Swiss knife. And this was variations that would suit different types of individual users. So you can see kind of where I'm getting here, like you have uh, a lot of tools available, but you also have users that will have different needs and they will need to package things differently. So on the left here, we have the original Swiss knife. On the, in the middle, we have a modern version of the Swiss knife, which is pretty much similar to, to the first one. But then on the right, we have a very different Swiss knife. It's something like from the blades and the, the, the tools to open canned food, suddenly we have a laser pointer, we have a USB stick, some sort of scissor, and someone actually thought it was a good idea and practical to carry that. So they built it, and you can get it. Of course, some people are a bit more uh, demanding, so this is another Swiss knife. And suddenly you have a lot of tools. If I look at them, I actually don't know what all the tools are for, but I, I recognize that someone actually thought that they need these tools, and the company started building it. So you can maybe see like a magnifying lens, some scissors, and some sort of uh, cutting tool, and someone needs it. It's not a knife that I would carry, but it's something that someone, someone needed. Now, this can go a bit too far. <clears throat> so this is the current World Guinness record for the largest Swiss knife. And it's uh, definitely something I would not carry. I doubt that someone is actually doing it. But, uh, but it, it, it's to see how far you can push a good concept to something that is entertaining but a bit silly. So coming back to the, the point, what, what I would like to highlight today is this uh, uh, comparison between uh, the idea of a Swiss knife, having small tools together that suit individual users, and what we do with Cloud Native. So I'll tell you a bit about uh, what I would put in my own Swiss knife. And in my Swiss knife, the first thing I would need for Cloud Native is something to do logging. Like, logging is really important, so you, I would need Kubernetes. Kubernetes actually gets you really, really far on what you can do with logging. But you also need projects like Fluentd that aggregate the logs and push them centrally. And then for metrics, very similar, in a very similar way, you would need uh, Prometheus. Now, I'll do a, a really, really simple demo. But it's just to show you how far you can get with something that is, uh, I hope you can see, yeah. Um, something that is kind of uh, uh, a simple tool, but that gets you really far. So in this case, I have like the traditional uh, Nginx deployment that everyone will use. And I start getting my logs. Everyone has done this. And it's pretty simple. But if you think about it, I'm not even talking about nodes, about where the resource is, is, is handling, uh, being deployed. And suddenly, I do a command, and the system is streaming the log back to me. I don't have to care about anything about the infrastructure. So that's, that's really powerful. But one thing that is even more powerful is that if we actually look at what's possible with this command, you don't even need to specify a pod or resource. You can actually say the kind of resource you want to stream logs for. So the example here, I'm using a label instead of specifying the, the, the pod I want to, to, to get logs from. And suddenly, like, you, you start seeing quite a lot more logs coming. And suddenly, you, you, if you think about it, the system is hiding all the complexity for you. It's streaming the logs. You don't have to give any details about the infrastructure. And this is incredibly powerful. And it's something that every time I, I explain this command to someone, it, it's something that uh, kind of comes back to me uh, uh, on the simplification from previous systems I had to deal with. Now, the second thing that I put on my Swiss knife is also uh, debugging tools. And again, Kubernetes gets you a long way. 
And debugging is kind of hard in Kubernetes, but I think the reason is one of the best things about containers and Kubernetes and cloud native, which is reproducibility. When we deploy our applications, we create container images, they are immutable. And when we deploy our clusters, we actually also use immutable nodes. The, the fact that all of this is reproducible and you can get really far in getting, achieving reproducibility is one of the key things about uh, cloud native tools. Now, when I started using Kubernetes, this was actually quite hard to do, uh, to handle. But this, I, I wanted to show how things also actually get, got better as well. So I'll do another very simple demo, and I'll come back to my pods here. So if you would try to log in to, to, like, to debug a pod, you would probably do something like trying to get a shell uh, to one of them. So let's say I wanted to get a bash shell. And this is a, to the, yesterday we had this nice talk about public container images and best practices. And this is an image that actually has best, best practices. I was trying to have a bash shell the image doesn't have bash because it doesn't need it to run the tool. So it, it just, just doesn't, doesn't provide. So what do I do? Like I need to access it. If there's a tool that I don't need. The tem temptation is to add stuff to the image. Then you make them bigger, more complex, and all of this can kind of escalate. So this, this specific uh, uh, image actually has SH instead of bash, so I can do that. But then I want to debug some network thing, TCP dump. There is no TCP dump. So I'm kind of stuck. So you, again, you start putting all these things on the image. Not a good idea. Now, this wasn't there when I started, but it was added uh, already, and it's actually stable in 125 for Kubernetes, which is the ability to deploy ephemeral debug containers. This is an amazingly uh, nice feature, which is the fact that you can attach a container to an existing container with a different image, and it will be in the same namespace, as you will see the same resources behind. So I have my image that I call conveniently my own Swiss knife, and I can attach it to the same container that I had before. And you can see that it's the same processes I'm seeing here. This is pretty cool. But I can see, now I can see speed up. And I can see, like, if some traffic comes in, I can actually go and see, okay, there's some HTML going on here, some HTTP calls. So it's so, so easy now to, to do this kind of thing that I think I should, I thought I would highlight it. Also, like, Things like top are actually available in the original one, but I'm fancy and cool, so I use htop. And then I'm also fancy and cool, so suddenly I have vi as well. So you can extend this to have your, all your usual debugging tools available, which is really, really handy. Now, the other part that I mentioned here is hot reloading. This is the other uh, complex part, which is the development cycle that people are used to is not necessarily easy to do with the cloud native deployments, or wasn't. Uh, because when you do changes, you have to rebuild images, redeploy, and, and this can be a lengthy project, a process. So there are two things I would like to highlight that are really interesting. I won't have time to demo them. One is things like the Bridge to Kubernetes plugin in VS Code, and the other one is Telepresence. And this is from the magic realm of cloud, cloud native, where suddenly your, your local development environment becomes part of the production clusters, and they do all the necessary tunneling. So that traffic is redirected to your local machine. You can use your IDE, IDE checkpoints, everything, like, as if you would be in the production cluster. Like, this is something we demo often internally as well, and it, it's kind of mind-blowing. Now, the next thing, again, I highlighted the talk yesterday about public container images. I really like it. Um, this is one of the issues we've had in the past couple of years, which is image handling. So we heard yesterday uh, the state of the how much work and challenges we have to improve this. But I list here two of the common uh, popular images, Alpine and Ubuntu. There are 30 megabytes, maybe let's say 100 megabytes. Who in here, raise your hand if you had to, had to handle an image that is 100 megabytes or more? All right, pretty much everyone. <laughs> I was expecting that. So this is, in, in, in reality, we have images that are quite, quite a lot bigger. So I give an example here. We have this ADM admin image that we use for, again, handy tools that we need. And we started growing it. So we now are now close to, to one gigabyte. So it's kind of time to think, should we make it smaller? Should we, should we split it? Which is all good things. But who in here has had to use an image that's one gigabyte or more? Raise your hand. All right, still quite a lot of people. Um, now, I'll jump right through it. Who in here has had to handle an image that is 19 gigabytes or more? One, two. 
All right? Yeah, a lot less. We actually have these images running on our clusters, and, and there is a reason for that. Uh, the example here is from, a, from an image from an experiment called Atlas, which is one of the LHC experiments. The way they are used to deploying their software is they have a central repository where they build and make everything available, all the releases, and they have a very efficient way to distribute codes uh, across the nodes in distributed clusters. When we moved to containers, uh, the obvious option was just to containerize all of this, and it's, there's actually no easy way to split it because the jobs got used to having one single place where all the software is available, and they access just what they need. If you move to containers, there's no way to split it and attach, no obvious way uh, up to now, to attach like one job to, to one image. So it's kind of a challenge to deal with this. So we started growing, we got to this 19 gigabytes, so we kind of stopped here. Someone had the idea to create like a ranking of the biggest image used at CERN, but this would be a really bad idea, so we didn't, we didn't start this. So this is where we are. Well, actually, it's not. It's, we have one record now, which is like two weeks ago, someone actually started using an image that is 76 gigabytes compressed, 125 gigabytes uncompressed. So who in here has an image that is 76 gigabytes? All right, that's good. That's good. You don't want to do this. But actually, this, I want to highlight this because there is a use case for this. Like, Cloud Native is not about microservices only anymore. There are so many different use cases for cloud native that you, people will come up with these ideas. So the problem here is really like if you have all these images deployed in hundreds, thousands of nodes, and you start pulling it, you're basically doing a denial of service in your registry and you're putting the network under a lot of pressure. So we can fix this. In mo most cases, we can fix it. And uh, one, one suggestion that, uh, that we have is from our head of computing security at CERN, Stefan, that is here in the picture. And the way he deals with security and users is he uses three tools. The first one is the baseball bat, and the baseball bat is for negotiation tactics. The second one is a water pistol. The water pistol is to kill servers in the data center because a dead server is pretty secure. The third one is a mop, and the mop is to clean up the mess people leave behind when dealing with security. So I think this process is probably something that we can learn from to, when dealing with users and, and the way they, they package their images. It also helps to have a big smile and uh, like Star Wars characters that you, can ha you see on the background to deal with users. All right, and then the last bit I want to, ah yeah, so the way we deal with this today is technically, so not really uh, solving the problem with the images that we want to do, but we also have a technical solution, which is to use projects like Dragonfly, which does peer-to-peer -peer distribution of containers, so you pull once and you basically distribute in the nodes and you reduce a lot to load on the registry. You still deal with big images, though. The other one is ContainerD and the support for remote snapshot in tools like ContainerD, where instead of downloading the image, you're actually mounting the image remotely, meaning that you can start your container immediately and then it will only fetch the files that it actually needs. So this is something we observed. It's like our jobs actually only use around 6% of the, of the images when these are like 19 gigabytes. So you can see the improvements on the right. The container startup goes from something like four and a half minutes to 15 seconds, and we reduce the tra tra network traffic dramatically. So the last tool I, I will talk about in my Swiss knife is GitOps, and this is something we promote internally heavily. There are tools like Flux and Argo CD that a lot of people are using already. The principle of GitOps is really that you have this central Git repository where you declare all your resources, all your uh, custom resources, everything. And you can use branches and you can do pull requests and, and reviews. And then you attach those uh, definitions to multiple clusters. So we have clusters on premises, we have them in the public cloud, and basically, you just have to say each cluster should get this, this set of resources from this branch, and you can even have like development, staging, production environments using this. So it's extremely powerful. It's something we do all the time. It also allows us to do what we call clusters as cattle, which is instead of having one big cluster where you put everything, it becomes really easy to have multiple clusters and spreading the application across multiple clusters. Uh, and this is really beneficial. So I'll give you an example of uh, how this is beneficial. I hope this is readable. So back in earlier this year, just before KubeCon Valencia, we actually had a, an incident at CERN. Someone posted in our internal chat saying, is there anything wrong, going wrong with the registry? The UI is failing on me, which is okay, let's see. 
Then a couple of minutes later, someone came and said, okay, I see the same, it, it's, it, it looks down. So we, we went to check, I was around, so we're looking. And what we realized is that a couple of, uh, like half an hour before we had updated the maintenance script that started slowing deleting all our production clusters. And these are not like production clusters where we manage everything, these are users' production clusters. Anything can be running there, we have no control. And we got really scared, and when we stopped it, it had deleted a hundred something clusters, so it's like a third of our capacity, and it's pretty serious incident. But we didn't know how far we had gotten with this idea of GitOps to our users, but we actually realized that even if we deleted a third of our production capacity, we had no downtime in any service, we had degradation. But not only that, when we got things back together, people were able to get their clusters back up and running in around 30 minutes. And this is really thanks to, to the, this idea of clusters as cattle and deploying in multiple clusters instead of having pet clusters. And also the fact that you can really dynamically deploy your applications really quickly. So in the end, we had one user saying, no worries, at the end it was a chaos monkey test. We pass it. It's not something we want to do again, but it was really a demonstration of the potential of all of this. So I'll finalize saying that this is my own Swiss knife. For Cloud Native, as we mentioned, everyone will have a different one. Not only that, if you come up with ideas for new tools that you would like to see, just propose them, join forces, get together with other people, build them, and we'll all be able to, to, to benefit from that work. So thank you very much and enjoy KubeCon.